changed very, very much indeed in that respect in Japan. And I'm sure uh, the more evidence we produce of members overcoming disease, of course, in the end, it will have a profound effect on the medical profession in this country and in every other country of the world. I mean, I, I speak, you know, with some emotion on this point, too, because uh, over the last, whatever it is, 14 years here, I have, you know, I've seen people suffer so terribly from the medical profession and the way it's acted in terms of uh, a patient's suffering. Uh, and this, you know, is appalling to see. Quite often, especially in the case of incurable diseases, what doctors say is the opposite of what they should be saying. So Buddhism would say that the enemy is fear. That is the enemy in terms of an incurable disease. It's not the disease itself. Yet doctors, because they don't understand that, by their very statements, will encourage people to lose hope. And this I, I could use strong words because I feel so strongly about it. I've seen people who are members, maybe maybe new members, but nevertheless they're practicing, who are really fighting their sickness through their practice, really, because of that, causing their own life force to surge through their veins, surge through their whole lives. Yet, they'll go to a hospital, and the doctor will say, maybe six months to live. This is absolutely evil. Really evil. So what happens? Because people have made a habit of relying on the medical profession, they take that as the truth and they begin to go downhill. Then maybe the members that surround them, all through their encouragement, they start to climb up again. You can see it happening in their lives because they're practicing again and they're building their life force again after it's been knocked out of them through the doctor's statement. And they'll get up and then it'll happen again if that is the karma of that person. This is the most terrible thing. It's an inexcusable thing. If a doctor, there may be times when it's right to say to someone, because they're a strong, spirited person, you know, well, maybe, strictly speaking, you've got six months to live, but if you really fight, if you really determine, you know, you can probably overcome this thing. And we all know of cases of, of people who are not chanting nam myoho kyo who just have that in, in a natural way, that incredible will to live. They're the fortunate people, and they usually live. That's the point, isn't it? So, this is a really ghastly thing. It's inexcusable for anyone to just say, you've got six weeks to live, just flat like that. Okay, if you, as I say, if you feel it's six weeks as a doctor, at least you should accompany it by saying, but if you fight, you can win, you know. Or if you fight, you can live longer. Nothing like that. A cold, absolutely uncompassionate, evil statement. I can't speak more strongly about it because I've seen people suffer unbelievably because of it. An inhuman approach. So this is, of course, what Sensei and, uh, and Toynbee are talking about here. Of course this doesn't apply to every doctor, but there are people who behave in that way. And the point is it's fear that kills. In the Gosha, Nichin Daishonin said, didn't he, nam myoho Eko is like the lion's roar. What sickness can therefore be an obstacle. What he's saying there is that so far as physical sickness is concerned, there is nothing which the life force cannot cure. That's what he's saying. But fear knocks you into hell, and in hell there is no life force, hardly at all. 
therefore the patience succumbs. Do you follow? So, especially for those of you who are in the medical profession, you know, this is something that really has to be examined deeply. You don't even have to be a religious person to give people a fighting spirit, hmm? do you? But one sees it all too rarely, I'm afraid. So, let's do lots of shakabuku in the medical profession. It's very, very important, isn't it? So now, uh, they go on to consider the old people. Don't look at me. Uh, but nevertheless, of course, it's a problem that is, I'm getting nearer to. And the point that they all, both authors bring up, is the importance of the family. What they call the three generation family. That a three generation family gives old people a reason to be useful and to live. So uh, this is near to my heart too because I was brought up in a three generation family. In my grandfather's house, fortunately looking back on it, two of my father's companies had gone bankrupt. One before World War I and one which he tried to set up immediately after World War I. And as a result, we had to live in my grandfather's house. And it was big enough. There were eight of us. There was my parents, my brother and I, the small boys, and my father's sister and her daughter, and my grandparents. And it is an unbelievable golden memory for me. Of course, there must have been tensions at times and rows, I suppose, which I didn't know about as a small boy. But the fact was that it was a wonderful place to live. And of course, my grandparents had uh, the, the, the chance of being with their grandchildren. And it was a beautiful period in my life. I can never, ever forget it. But definitely a golden experience. And I absolutely treasure it. And added to that, my grandfather was my greatest friend. Actually, the greatest friend I've had in my whole life. I look upon him as uh, that wonderful friend. We didn't necessarily have to talk together. We could sit in the same room and be marvelously comfortable. And when my grandfather was feeling down a bit, he'd talk to me quite freely. And uh, in some small way, I suppose, I was able to encourage him. And likewise, if I was down, I always went to my grandfather. But we were incredible friends. We were, by the way, we were born on the same day. So uh, we must have had some close karmic connection in that respect. But I certainly do believe that that was an incredible thing, that three-generation family. Uh, but of course, the, like all things, economics plays such a big part, don't they, in life these days. You can't afford, on the average, to have a house that can take a three-generation family, especially if you live in the middle of London. There may be more chance if you're a farmer or living in the country. But in London, you know, you've got to be or, uh, almost a millionaire these days to have a house so big. So there are those problems. And it's the pressure of the economy and economic circumstances which has also broken up the family, as well as other reasons such as the age gap which grew between young and old for various reasons, uh, really from World War II onwards. So there was a great contrast. I'm, I'm sorry to give my personal experience, but I'll continue it, because there was a great contrast due to economic pressures and to social trends by the time my parents were grandparents and getting old. So they were imbued with this idea that they should be totally independent, that they shouldn't be a, a burden, as it was put, on my brother or myself, and that we should never consider having to uh, put them up and look after them, you know, in their old age. And this became like a sort of obsession with them. And however hard we tried, we couldn't shake them from it. And as a result of that, uh, just to give you this simple example, uh, based on my own family, my father died, my mother was left alone, 
by then they had in with this passion for independence they'd move far away both from myself and my brother and their own sisters brothers and so on and they were living uh, far away really but it was on the south coast it wasn't the place where any of any of their sisters or brothers or myself or my brother could easily pop around the corner and look after them but this was a deliberate thing not to be a burden and when my, my father died, my mother absolutely refused to change her situation. That's where she wanted to be, and she was going to stand alone. I mean, it's wonderful courage, really. But on the other hand, in the end, it just created, you know, immense difficulties because uh, of that segregation, uh, the problems of looking after her when she really became very old uh, were impossible to cope with. And what is more, her friends who lived, she'd made friends in that area, you know, they said that they wanted to look after her. They knew it would be difficult because she didn't want to move. But on the other hand, friends can never do quite the same as a family can do. And I always feel that in the end, my mother had to go into a nursing home and she spent the last few years of her life there. Uh, I always feel that was a very unsatisfactory thing. And I know Mitsuko feels the same. You know, we should really have had her with us. So, but I think that it's the old thing of extremes, isn't it? Human beings go to these extremes. So at one time, the three-generation family was common. It existed everywhere, a hundred years ago. Uh, but then this opposite extreme, going totally in the other direction, the old people are supposed to be being independent to the last moment, moment of their lives. So uh, that's not the way either. It comes back, doesn't it, to finding this middle way. The middle way, I believe, is the three-generation family. I believe that there will be a swing back, but it mustn't swing too far. Because at the same time as the old people should be with their family, also provision must be made in the social system for the old people to... Uh, be able to work, do small part-time jobs, uh, to be useful, uh, as well as also being useful in one way or another in the family. So the burden on the younger people of the family, of course, can be greatly lightened in that way. And also there has got to be some sort of reform in the economic system so that where families wish to be together, they're able to, to uh, uh, find accommodation in which to live that sort of life. But I'm sure the family has got to come back. The family is absolutely fundamental, really, to the social system and to human harmony and happiness. And somehow, we have to consider how to bring it back and reinstate it. So far as the age gap is concerned, well, I reckon in NSUK one can see the way in which the, the so-called age gap just disappears in a, such a natural way. So uh, this is a matter, isn't it, of broadening the minds of older people through this practice and also in the case of younger people, appreciating what the old people can do in terms of their experience and understanding of life. So this is another area of social reform I'm convinced in the future. The family is the foundation. Whichever way one looks at it, it is the foundation of society. And in some way, uh, it's got to be reinstated instead of destroyed, because that's what has happened recently. So the situation, of course, is getting more acute because the number of old people in the world, or in the Western world, and it applies to this country too, are getting a higher and higher in proportion to other ages because of medicine, medical science, enabling people to live longer. But it also, as you know, interestingly enough, Buddhism uh, in the sutras and in the Gosha talks about the way life in cycles is either extending its, its life in this, in this physical world or at other times in the, in the rhythm of life, it's decreasing. Well, at the moment, it's extending. It's been extending as far back as we're able to look historically. Uh, 
when the Saxons were uh, in charge of anyway the southern half of this country, we know that the average lifespan was round about 40 or even sometimes less. And then, you know, due to medical science, due to the trend of social trends and so on, that lifespan has increased and increased and increased until today many, many people are living into their 90s and there's an increasable number of people living to over 100. This is going, extending all the time. So that some people who say that by the 21st century it will be not uncommon to live till you're 130 years old. What a thought, isn't it? But nevertheless, this is the trend. So there has to be ways and means, of course, of adjusting things in society to cope with that. So that's another thought for the future. But certainly, old age, from the point of view of Buddhism, old age should be a, a precious, wonderful time. We work through our lives. Old age should be a time, as Sensei put it, when old people can uh, be, lead more peaceful lives, at the same time should continue to be valuable in one way or another. A time uh, when they can pass on their wisdom and experience to others in the same way my grandfather passed on his to me. A time to work as much as you want to work without pressure behind it and so on. So aging is one of the four sufferings, as Sensei points out in here. Uh, nevertheless, we can change that karma if people desire to do so. So uh, I remember in the Japanese group that I used to practice with when I wasn't looking after the international group, which we did both, the group which Mitsuko belonged to, and I lived in Japan, there was an amazing little old lady I never really knew what her name was, but she never missed a single meeting. Uh, no one quite knew what her age was, but it was somewhere guessed to be in her middle 80s. And she was absolutely tiny. And when she knelt down on the, on the tatami matting to chant the Gonsan, she looked just like a little ball. <laughs> or amazing little old thing she was, because she was stooping quite a lot, and she was so tiny. But she never missed a meeting, and she never missed a Daimokotosa. She was fighting with everyone else, even though she was so old. She knew what was going on, what activities there were. If there was some, you know, a woman's AGM or something like that, there she'd be, chanting away with everyone else. Sometimes she used to fall asleep while she was chanting. <laughs> and then she became even more like a little ball. <laughs> But everyone left her to sleep, and in due course she'd wake up again. <laughs> but to me, it was a very beautiful sight, because I really felt she was doing something valuable, you see. Every time she went to a meeting, it meant she was doing something valuable. She was joining in with everyone else, young and middle-aged, and really fighting for Kosa Rufu, right to the very end of her life, I'm sure. So I don't know how she died. Maybe she died sitting you know, in front of the Gohans in one day. I wouldn't be surprised. But it was a great example of how uh, activities for Kosa Nufu, how an old person really can, in Sensei's words, die in the front, I remember him saying, to die in the front line of the battle for Kosa Nufu you know, is the greatest way to die. And I'm sure that little old lady did just that. So it gives an example of how to uh, our movement can give old people purpose in life right to the very end. So we shouldn't hesitate to shakabuku. It might be interesting, for instance, for you to know that at the Cherry Tree Group meeting, I gave them guidance that that was the one meeting of the Cherry Tree Group every year. That was all. There were no other cherry tree group activities because the important thing was that the older ones really get in amongst everybody else and do kosanufu without any separation from the young and the middle-aged and so on. And I think they all understood the reason. So uh, this is another, without laboring the point, this is another aspect of social life which of course the middle-aged and the younger people have to 
uh, improve and reform in the future. So I wonder, you know, who of you might find yourselves doing that? Maybe there's one person in the New Century group, looking back to the other session as well, you know, who will be involved in that sort of reform in one way or another. It could be in a volunteer way, it could be in a professional way. But certainly, members of NSUK, I'm sure, looking 10, 15 years ahead, will be in the forefront of that sort of movement. But coming then, finally, I think, really, to national welfare, to the welfare state, which is perhaps the most enlightening and important part of this whole section in the book. I'd like to ask Sansa, uh, Sandra to read Sensei's comments on page 100. Both socialism and capitalism have serious flaws. Capitalism has sacrificed the happiness and welfare of individual human beings to the pursuit of profit. Socialism has suppressed human liberty for the sake of standardized equality. Failure to take into consideration the dignity of human life is behind the faults in both systems. The same thing is true of nations now striving to establish welfare societies because though they, may, they revise their systems and proclaim their search for general well-being and happiness, the good they attempt is entirely material in its orientation. At present, there is no nation that can guarantee <clears throat> its people's spiritual welfare rooted in respect for the dignity of life. Actually, this is an incredible paragraph. It's worth reading it over and over. And of course, this really shakes or rattles the rooted political stance which people take. People have always been born or brought up totally based on the Conservative Party or totally based on the Labour Party. Then Sensei chucks in a bomb and said, both, you know, are imperfect. And it's so true. So if you're traditionally labor, uh, you traditionally condemn conservatism, and vice versa. But in fact, who had thought of the fact that in socialism, you do not permit the people the freedom to gain benefit through their own efforts in strict the strict socialist philosophy, uh, its equality, and also, uh, of course, in conservatism, the person is sacrificed for profit. So in fact, freedom is lost in both systems. And again, it comes to this point of the way of perfect balance, doesn't it? The middle way, which has not been found in that respect. So a system must give the human being the right to work and to make effort. And you will really see that that is necessary. If there's no incentive for people to make effort, inevitably there will be no creativity. People will be lost in a sea of laziness or apathy weakness and helplessness. Life becomes dull and meaningless. And of course, everything declines as a result of that. Everything in society becomes stagnant, including the economy. So if there is no effort necessary, then it encourages people to sit back and take, 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 rather than give, give, give taking as if it was their right. I believe that is evident today in our society. People take because they think it's their right as a human being to do so, sometimes without making any effort. This is the sickness of our society, I firmly believe, or one of the sicknesses. So in socialism, uh, every accent is on the material, physical side of things as, of course, it is in capitalism, which is based on profit, often, as I said, at the expense of the individual. This is the problem of Britain. The problem, too, in many other countries, but certainly it's the great problem here. So 
So the welfare state is great, but the welfare state should follow the middle way again, shouldn't it? The way of perfect balance, which whilst it provides for those who are really in dire circumstances, at the same time it permits people the freedom to make effort, to be creative. It's an interesting thought. Whatever happens, both those two main political systems, capitalism and socialism, are, are based on economics. Nothing else but economics. They're not taking into consideration the spiritual aspect of life. And that is why today religion, uh, education, culture, the arts, all these aspects of life, which are in fact the spiritual aspects of life, are suffering dreadfully. Because the economy is not geared or aimed to support them. So it should be the other way around, as Sensei points out. The economy should be aiming to serve culture and education, the arts, and so on. But sadly, in a political sense, the gods of today are production and economics, aren't they? This is what we're suffering from. And this is because of lack of wisdom. Uh, who, I wonder, from the new century group or elsewhere in Ennis, UK, is going to move in one of these days into politics? I hope we have members who move both into the Socialist Party and the Conservative Party and whatever other middle-of-the-way party there may be. Because both systems have this terrible fault. And without a doubt, someone who moves into those parties and is chanting and basing every action and decision they take on the Gohonsa, they will gradually bring the philosophy of the middle way to bear in each party. Don't you think? It's a very fascinating thought to see how it unfolds. But I hope soon, you know, we'll find at least one person who decides to make their career in politics. And after that, I'm sure, it'll lead to one more and one more. Until the wisdom of the Gonson really is being brought to bear in all political parties. So as I think I said before, argument and dialogue about the way to do things is great and necessary. That is the diff could be the difference between the parties. But each party in the end should be following a middle way so, are, so far as their broad aims and purposes are concerned. Do you see what I mean? So the argument between political parties should not be on the ultimate aim which is upholding above all things the dignity of life. The difference between the parties should be the way they may decide to try and approach that problem. Now, when we have it, uh, if we're part of a district, we argue about how to plan something or what sort of activity to do in order to achieve our ultimate aim. That's what the political field should be about central to everything should be upholding the supreme dignity of life. So in that way, I'm sure, one of these days, far ahead in the 21st century, that sort of influence will begin to become apparent. So in other words, uh, we have to provide the shin of shiki. Hmm? We have to bring the protection of the shin of shiki shin to bear, not only in medicine, but also in society as well. And that means a great religion. That is the importance of SGI, to bring that aspect to bear, the spiritual aspect of life, into uh, a societies which nearly all over the world are based totally on the material, production, and the economy. So there's a great revolution ahead there, too. 
And our whole, the whole aim of all social trends, and political trends, should be, of course, to bring out the people's creativity, to bring out the best in them, so that they can be fulfilled and happy. So without doubt, the authors pointed out, and I think it, it's true, that because of the whole process of technology, the, auto the automation of industry, people are going to have more leisure time. What are they going to do with that leisure? This is bound to come. We're already going through a new industrial revolution. Of that I'm convinced. And the trend is what we see, incredible unemployment. We don't want unemployment, we want balance. But that balance is bound to mean working less hours in terms of one's fundamental job. So people, I'm sure, will, will desire to develop their creativity. And this should be encouraged. But since the whole concept of society is based on economics, it, it is not being encouraged as much as it should be. So people who have been active, say, with their hands in, in, in a factory or wherever, they, they can develop their skills in terms of crafts. People have more leisure. They have more time to feel something about beautiful things. They may be more willing to pay the money to have those beautiful things in their houses or give them as gifts. So I'm sure the field of crafts you know, will grow and grow in the future. The time is coming when at last we can go back to those beautiful crafts and people can get joy out of their creativity in respect to them. And in many other ways, of course, in the arts, in self-education and education even to adults, you know, all these things can grow. So really, you know, it's a fascinating time coming ahead. It's not a bad world, it no need to be a bad world if we really bring to bear the wisdom of human beings onto it and through the growing movement of SGI everywhere in the world directing it correctly. So shakabuku, more and more people who are practicing and developing their natural wisdom is crucially important, isn't it? We have to develop every year more and more shakabuku so that we have people in every area of society. So it's already five past three. Uh, the book ends by talking about, or the section ends by talking about motherhood and also the population. If, I, if you could bear with just five more minutes, is that all right? Okay, so first of all, motherhood. Uh, what the authors strongly say, whether you think it's old-fashioned or not, I don't know, but they really firmly say the under normal circumstances, it's the mother that must rear the child. And I can't help feeling, in every respect, the common sense of that statement. And of course, Buddhism would really support it. After all, we're born or conceived in our mother's womb. There is an incredible attachment, therefore, in every respect between the mother and the child. And that is needed by the child in its tender growing stages. This is really what Sensei and Toynbee agree about. Of course, there may be exceptions, exceptional circumstances where the father has to take on the, the bringing up of a small child. But in a general sense, how can there be any argument really about the fact that the child, the small child, needs the mother? So, Toynbee suggests that the mother should be paid a salary. I thought that was a great idea. Very, very sensible, isn't it? Perhaps one of these days that will become the fashion. I think it would be a wonderful thing because it immediately gives dignity, really, to motherhood and a measure of independence to the mother. So I think that's a great thing. Also, uh, and you've heard me say this before, but the point Sensei brings up in the, in the book, The Creative Family, 
that it is incredibly important for young women before they are saddled with children to develop some sort of career or great interest in life beyond purely and simply being a wife and a mother. And that, the only time for that is when you're young and before you're actually having to uh, bring up a family. Then, of course, with that career or great absorbing interest in life, uh, you have something that you can probably deal with part-time whilst the children are growing. And then when the children are grown up enough to be able to look after themselves, you can go back full blast to that career which you've been longing to get on with one day when the children have grown up. This is very important, isn't it? So please take that to heart and make sure that you do seize this opportunity while you're single or while you have no children in order to do that. So far as population is concerned, uh, Buddhism is very clear on this point. Sensei mentions it uh, in, of course, total opposition to what the Catholics think. But the birth control, that is preconception, preconception birth control, Sensei states, is a right of humankind. It is our right to be able to live our lives as we believe is correct according to our own wisdom, which relates in turn to our own unique nature and character and mission in life. So we have the right as human beings to choose when to have children and when not to have children. I'm sure this is, you know, an to me, an unarguable point. So because we're unique when we have children is important and it must relate to our own unique lives as parents. But equally, of course, because we are responsible for those children, we feel their lives and therefore we should know when we should have children from the child's point of view too. So this is, can only come from wisdom, isn't it? Each child that we have has a mission or a purpose. That purpose relates to the time, the time when they should be born. Therefore, we should feel, you know, yes, you know, we really must decide to have a child next year or whatever. Some innate wisdom will, because we're practicing to the Brahms, help us to feel that. So this is a very important point, I think. So this is where other religions... Can I hold on a moment? This is where other religions, uh, you know, have misled people. So they say that children are the gift of God, for example. You know, therefore, you've always got to leave the way open to have them. And you mustn't use contraceptive methods. That means it's out of your control. You as a parent should have the wisdom to know when you should procreate a child. Hmm? Because that is part of your mission in life. Just the same as the time you should have them is important from the point of view of the child's mission in life. So in Genesis, in the Bible, it says that man should be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and also it says subdue it. Man should be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. But that is not the way you know, which Buddhism teaches. We should be fruitful in exact relationship with the state of the population of this world, which means in accordance with our wisdom. Only the parent can know when to have a child. That's the important point. Therefore, every parent who's practicing to the Gohonsu and keeping their wisdom free and freely flowing should be able to reach exactly the right decision on that point. So, of course, Buddhism also points out that parents are, in fact, uh, an instrument in the karma of the child. Right? We are born, aren't we, to particular parents. But the parents we bo are born to, we choose, in a sense, in terms of our cause and effect. 
In a sense, therefore, the children are on loan to those parents, right? During that tender time of upbringing and education. Eventually, the children are bound to move off and stand alone. And of course, there's a great bond between them. Therefore, they maintain contact. But strictly speaking, in other words, we're not, we have no right to possess our children. Hmm? To try to hold them. Because they have to continue with their lives and their mission. So the joy of a parent should be seeing the child standing alone and getting on with the job. In a, in a sense, rather like the master and disciple relationship. So there is a balance in the world so far as population is concerned. The important point is that more and more parents are using their wisdom and taking charge of their lives and having children in the wisest possible way, isn't it? Do you follow? Someone wanted to ask a question. Maybe we could maybe we could put it in some. It is an important social point, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's try and spare fifteen minutes or so of the next session and tackle that point. Okay. Good. I'm sorry. I've kept you as usual a bit over time. Is everyone feeling okay about what we've discussed? <laughs> Lots to think about <coughs> and discuss yourselves. Great. Well, thank you very much for listening. Very patient. Thanks so much. Let us see you next month, but there's a small change in time. Because the uh, next session is on Saturday, the 7th of November, it's the same day.